the amount of people that are here. Um, this is Nareen Barshai. She's one of the co-founders of Genspace, and she's a well-known bio artist in New York. Um, anyways, and uh, today we invited her to come do a slime mold workshop. Um, and she's going to talk to us about uh, network systems in nature in general, not only animals, right? Uh, in this lecture, and then we're going to have a workshop as a second part uh, of uh, this event. And uh, thank you to the Electronic Society who made this possible, and also Catherine Morwaki, and, and we've co-organized this event. So hope you enjoy it. Um, in nature. 
lecture, and then we'll start talking about the slime mold. But before that, let me introduce you the three bacteria that I'm working with. Actually, I'd like to some examples. Very, very careful about how it does that. 
And that's where all these uh, beautiful uh, organic vegetables come from, from basically being very, very creative about solving these problems. So each bacteria has a very definitive way of behavior. So think about it like maybe like people who each one has a very distinctive walk. Um, so each of these three bacteria that I'm working with has um, also a very distinctive way of moving in space. This is particularly the um, Panibacillus vortex, which I'll call P vortex. And the way it moves in space, it will forge this huge, um, almost like gear systems, and will start vortexing to create these um, its patterns. So this is under a binocular microscope. You can see these billions of bacteria. Um, just to give you a, a sense of how it moves in space, it kind of moves um, in half uh, moon shapes. So that's why later you'll see it creates all these really beautiful spirals. And this is the T, which is more like, uh, <coughs> think about watercolor. So it's like, it likes to sporge in space. And, and then again, this is, this is the uh, vortex. So eventually for me, um, what you see here, as much as people would think about it as, you know, oh wow, this is amazing um, in terms of aesthetics, this is, these are really incredible uh, images, I'm trying to think about these are visual representation for communication systems and very complex visual representations for, for these communication systems. So I'm going to start telling you a little bit about some of the experiments I did in the lab. For example, this one, I tried to test how the bacteria, if it's so intelligent, maybe I can uh, create a few problems for it and see how it understands, for example, space. And I, I seeded the bacteria on small petri plates and large petri plates. Uh, the top row would be the small petri plates, which would be half the size of the plate that you just um, had here. And I was really amazed with the results. I mean, I, I have it here in the same slide just to, to show you the difference. It, if you look at the center of the city here and here, you can see that this, you know, would be a small plate. It's the same amount. On the other hand, the bacteria, is, when it starts growing, it didn't start forging arms and then stopped and realized, oh, I don't have enough food now. I have to change my the way I'm behaving. It's almost like it had a GPS spies or understanding <laughs> of the space and, and started growing and adopting its pattern from, and patterns from the beginning. Something that I was uh, really amazed when I was talking to the scientists that I'm working with, and there, there are two different possibilities. One is obvi obviously uh, 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 physics, the diffusion in the space itself and how uh, it um, fills the particles and the density of, of the other and, and uh, and the space within the Petri plate. But on the other hand, there might be some chemical signals that they're sending to sense the space itself. And this is something that um, they're still um, researching. <coughs> then I went on and asked uh, more question: if it understands space, does it <coughs> understand gravity? And I, I did this few experiments, partly because I really wanted, again, to um, to think about, I mean, this bacteria actually grows in, in the ground and on, um, and on roots. So obviously in nature and in our body, if I want to try to simulate um, the natural habitats of this bacteria, I really want to see how it understands um, shapes and form and gravity. And 
these are some of the experiments that I've done. And it was, it was really great because when you can see how um, it's so responsive to, to the shape. For example, this is the P vortex. When it has very slopey slides, it's just kind of like almost splashes itself. Something I've never seen um, happening like that mm -hmm. in the lab um, or things like that. And, and this is the T, for example, which is really great because you could see that in this area, it would kind of like slide itself, but when it has a very slopey area, it's so much more careful and it creates these more detail-like um, patterns. So I went on and thought about how, if it understands topography, how I can create more complex topographies. And I started experimenting with um, applying sound while I prepare the agar plates and start performing it with it also in, in the gallery space. <laughs> so what I do is, so as I said, agar is like jello, so it takes between like a minute or two minutes depending on the temperature of the room to solidify, and I'm using that time frame to apply different sound waves and sound frequencies to create um, various topographies in space. Um, this was specifically made with different sounds that were applied. And these are some of the results that come out um, from, from these experiments. So you play different genres of music for each of them? These specific ones are just very pure sound tones and sound frequencies. For example, this one is the P vortex with a triangle wave in 200 hertz. This is the T with, uh, I don't remember all of them. Uh, <laughs> what does it say here? Let me to see that. Oh, I can see this one. Um, with a sine wave. Um, and this one is the C with a sine wave at 50 hertz, and this is the T with a square wave at 15 kilohertz. <laughs> and this is the C with uh, what is it? Uh, um, oh, a phaser wave with 1,000 hertz, and this is uh, the vortex with a square wave at 1,000 hertz. And um, the interesting <laughs> thing that happened here. Um, was that, for example, the C and the T are very interesting. They're closer to each other in their genome um, than the vortex. And although their genome is very different, they would sometimes change their patterns and behavior based on uh, different environment and settings. So for example, if I uh, grow the C on the environmental setting that the T would, would like, so called, it will start imitating um, its patterns and vice versa. But what happened with the, these sound uh, experiments was that the C and the T started interchanging their identity in the same place. Something that I later, um, I showed some of the results to the scientists in Tel Aviv and they started doing uh, sound experiments in their lab. So I was really happy about that and we're trying to figure out what's happening. And maybe at the end of the talk, when we understand more things about um, communication, and uh, you would be able to um, think with me why it's happening. Something else that I wanted to share with you is something interesting happened to me lately. So usually scientists would um, grow microbes in an incubator. They want fast results. They need to understand things quickly and to move on with their research. I usually um, leave it on the best space in room temperature because most of my experiments would later go to a gallery space or to a museum and I need to simulate that. And one time I was really in a hurry and I needed a cycle that didn't work out and I needed a new cycle and I decided to put lots of nutrients in my plates and to put it in the incubator. And this is what happened, this thing. And I thought to myself, oh my god, these are bacteria that not only do not communicate with each other, but they probably have Asperger's or something, I don't know. 
<laughs> and uh, if this is intelligent book theory, then I'm, I'm in a really bad uh, place. So, I mean, I obviously had to do a whole new cycle, and, and then after a few days, it hit me, because I was looking again at this, and I started to compare between the two, and try to understand what just happened here in this plate. I mean, they had fun. They had lots of nutrients. They, they, were, they were warm and fuzzy. So they just started to sport out. They didn't have any problem to solve because they had plenty of everything that they just wanted. So what does it mean? And what does it mean about us? I mean, when do we become creative or what are, the, what are the situations where we do need to be creative? Is it only when we are facing problems, stress, war? I mean, these are some of the questions that um, are interesting to ask. And, and more than that, I'm trying to understand what makes us see something as beautiful and something else as not. I mean, what gives us pleasure when we think about, for example, a plate like this? Is there something in us that can recognize patterns in nature, that can recognize complex network systems, that immediately gives us some sort of pleasure of what we understand of aesthetics? both in visual and in contact, content. So maybe there is something in our subconscious or chemicals that connects between us. I, I don't know, but it's other questions that are interesting to ask when we think about creativity, um, about what we think as aesthetics, or what we even think about communication systems. What kind of patterns um, and mathematic systems in nature can we recognize consciously, subconsciously? Something to think about. So here are some of the um, close-ups or details of some of the plates, just that you could understand what's happening there. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, in the experiment, we had the tree climbing up. What was the surface made out of? It's all agar. Occur with the nutrients that that specific bacteria. So each one has completely different nutrients that was tested for at least 30 years to understand what they like by the scientists. Did you also apply the sound wave while they were growing the whole time, or just for the agar prepping, or did you do both? Um, I started experiment with that too. This, the, the experiments that you saw here were only for the agar itself. <coughs> There's, I, I still don't have a good way to um, document the, the growth while, well, I mean, like the, growth, the growth itself, but yeah, it's... It seems like your experiments are, are near two-dimensional. Is there any algas where you have a, like a sphere and you inject it into the center of the alga so you can see a three-dimensional manifestation of, of these? <laughs> You know, intelligence. Um, it, it seems like it's close to two dimensional. Two dimensional. Because you, you put it on a plate. Right. So it, they manifest this intelligence in a, in right. a two dimensional context. Do you say like an alga, like a sphere? You can inject the, the bacteria into the center of the alga? So, the so they can manifest it in a three dimensional way? So, for example, I mean, this is, this is on a three dimensional surface, okay? And you can see how when it, uh, I mean, there's a wreckage there, but when they kind of like come down the slope, they change their behavior completely. Um, and there's a lot to say here. I mean, uh, for example, they have completely different uh, density and patterns here. And then when they come, they have um, these sort of patterns. And then they kind of feel like, oh, we have enough uh, food and space, so let's just forge. So they're like completely, almost watercolor, just um, splashing out. And then they kind of resist and start um, 
creating these um, these well, services. But I know they... what you're asking because um, I'm I'm working with uh, with other three dimensional um, objects. One of the ideas is so. For example, if you put two, uh, if you seed the same bacteria from um, and create in a way two different colonies on the same plate, you would see how they start uh, forging on the plates, but then they would, it's almost like an army, they would just stand in front of each other, and um, I don't have pictures here of that, and, and they want, um, they want to kind of like interlate their patterns together, sometimes they do, and we can see, you know, things like this happening. Um, oh, where is it? I lost my mouse. Okay. So you can see things happening here, for example, how they would, you know, they would forge arms and then interlace. But one of the experiments I'm doing is is uh, using um, endless loops objects to see how if they would um, eventually communicate with each other. And so I don't know if that's what you're asking. I'm just wondering, like, there's all, all these like three-dimensional advancements in, in software. Um, I'm just wondering if you can have like a, instead of flat petri dish, like you have a three-dimensional sphere, spherical gel where you can inject the counties in the center of the gel, mm -hmm. and you see them they manifest it instead. Right? Well, I mean, think about it. The experiments I'm doing with sound, the topographies, these are these are not two-dimensional. I mean, in but they're size limited of the in area, terms of the, the depth, they're right? They're huge. I mean, um, but you see what I'm saying, right? You, you can guess. see it in a clear spherical gel. I think they would need air, no? So I'll, I'll move forward, and then maybe I can, yeah. I can show you later some some other things. Um, so yeah, so to move forward, how do they do that? And we still don't know much about how bacteria communicates with each other, but recent uh, research uh, maybe could shed light about this specific bacteria, and I'm talking about the Vibrio fischeri and um, the um, Kaline bobtail squid. So I don't know if you know a little bit about about it. Anyone heard? No, because it, it lately it's so popular, and everybody's talking about it. So. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Um, so, so the bobtail, uh, Hawaiian bobtail squid is like three centimeter, uh, which is uh, I think one point two inch wide. One point two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it resides in very very shallow water. So. Um, Basically, it, and in order to survive, when it comes out at night to hunt for its food, it has this special ability to understand how much light, moonlight and starlight, is illuminating on its back and be able to uh, project the same amount of light, exactly the same amount of light, to eliminate, to erase the shadow. So how does it do that? <laughs> Interesting. Oh, so yeah, so yeah, during the day, it's uh, digging uh, in the ground and hiding. And then during the night, it would come out to hunt for food. So during the day, it, it's, um, it's sleeping. So it wants to, um, save on its energy. And what it does, it ventilates out all the water in its body. And in its body resides very special bacteria. And this is the Vibrio fischeri. So it released the Vibrio fischeri. And Vibrio <coughs> fischeri is a plankton. It exists in the ocean. It's everywhere. But because it resides in its uh, stomach in a, in a certain density, as a colony, it would start doing something together that I want to talk about. So just before that, 
this is um, this is the screen, and on its back it has uh, special sensors that um, can um, detect uh, how much light comes from moon, moonlight and starlight. And not only that, it can understand the angle of the light. So eventually, it's photophone organ, which is very similar to uh, the way our eyes are working, only our <coughs> eyes are um, receiving light and the photophone um, is uh, emitting light, which is really interesting also in terms of evolution because the potential of doing that exists there. It's just almost like what's turning on and what's turning off in terms of our genome. So then the bacteria during uh, the day, so during the day we just, you know, release all the bacteria out and then, you know, bacteria likes to grow and, uh, and, um, and uh, um, reproduce itself and grow and reproduce and grow and reproduce. So in the nighttime, when it gets to a certain amount that is right for it, it has a special genome that is called uh, fluorescent and it will start to bioluminate. How does it do, do that? That's a, a very interesting thing to think about. I'm, I'm just going to jump through some. So what it does is actually very interesting. So think about um, all you guys in the room. Think about only one person here that is saying, me. And then someone else joins and says, me. And then everyone here in the room says, me. And when we get to a certain threshold of this sound in this room, we understand that we have to, let's say, stand up, okay? Or start singing or whatever that is. So let's say that you are programmed to understand what this threshold is, and that you would act only when we arrive to that density, when we arrive to that threshold, when we hear, we don't even have to think about it, we'll immediately do something. And that's exactly what the bacteria is doing. So it sends signals out. It sends all the signals out, me, me, and it listens to. When there's enough bacteria that is doing that, everyone is sending a signal out, and everyone is listening, then they can start doing something. And this is what's called uh, quorum sensing. So in a way, they count. Quorum. So Bonnie Bossler, who uh, studied the behavior of Fisheri, uh, and this is actually from her talk, has really, really great ways to explain it. So every, every bacteria needs two things, actually three things. One is to be able be able to send signals, to be able to listen to the signal, and the third thing is to be able to act upon that signal. And when they get enough um, high cell density, they start to buy luminance. Sorry, um, are you talking about um, the chemical substance? Yeah, exactly. So they're using um, the chemical hormones um, uh, that they're using are auto uh, inducers. Um, these are the chemical molecules that they're using to signal to each other. So they'll send a, a signal out, and you know the signals will spread around. And then another bacteria will be able to listen. In order to listen to that specific message, it has to have a very special receptor. So think about it almost like a key and a lock. That your key can unlock only your door or a specific door in your building. So every signal that would uh, arrive to me, I would be able to listen only to what I'm expecting to, to know. And this is how it works, and then eventually I will act upon it. And I will act upon it only when there is, again, this very um, um, specific um, threshold that we all arrive to. So not only that the bacteria can communicate with each other to do that, it can also communicate with the squid because eventually, I mean, um, they're there for each other. The squid is um, enabling the bacteria to eat, to, uh, it protects it, 
and the bacteria create um, a, 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 the light source for this weed to survive when it goes hunting. So it, it's it's interesting to see that we, we know that bacteria can communicate to each other. Uh, it behaves as a multicellular organism. So we saw that when it's a singular cell, it does nothing, it just sends messages out there. And if nobody's listening or if there's not enough um, of them, then they're not going to do anything about it. Um, it understands the self and other, which is very important. And it can develop uh, strategies to improve uh, quorum sensing. And this is what the speed looks like um, in the dark. So really, really beautiful. And recently, I, I spoke to um, a professor in Dublin who is studying uh, Bacillus bacteria, which is a similar bacteria to the one I'm working with. And they found at least nine signals that they can recognize. So part would be self, understanding self, understanding other, understanding other that is like self, understanding other that is like self, but not necessarily threatening uh, my life. So it's not like a, a virus or a pathogen or a killer bacteria. And then understanding that they're in danger. So these are only some of the signals that um, we can recognize today about bacteria communication. And there's other um, organisms that are also using quorum sensing. And these are social insects like ants or um, wasps and bees. And I don't know if. Is that working or is, is that something? Nest to a new food 
source location, or it will list to any location because of some um, disaster or um, any other condition, weird condition that they would have. What they do is that they send ads all over, and those who come back would start communicating to each other. If more ants would communicate about the specific uh, food source or about uh, a really good place for um, the nest, that would um, be very similar to the way worm sensing. And then they will make this decision of moving the nest there. They will use a lot of trails, so they would be able to smell or to um, follow these trails later. Um, Bees, on the other hand, um, especially honeybees, have what we know of the famous woggle dance. Um, are you familiar with that a little bit? I'm sorry, I have, I, I have these really nice videos. But um, so, so bees, it's really incredible. They would be able to understand what is the distance between for example, their beehive to the food source and compare it with the angle of the sun. But the sun is moving, right? So they will be able to memorize the time of the day. I mean, it's not even memorized. It's some, probably something that is um, yeah, in their amazing brains. And, and then the time that they arrive back to the beehive, <laughs> But then the other bee that would go into the food source later on in the day would be able to calculate, again, the angle of the sun. So they will know exactly where the food source would be in relationship to the beehive, depending on how the bee is dancing. So they dance kind of like in these eight movements, but the dance and the way they wiggle their, um, their body would be, um, exactly to the angle of the sun and um, the nest itself. So they understand this way, how far, um, the, what's the distance, what, uh, how, in which direction or which angle the, the food source is. And then depending on the times and uh, the waggling, they would also know the distance to the food source. So there's a lot of information that uh, they can communicate to all the other bees um, in that sense. You, you had a question? Yeah, I was yeah, gonna ask, do they like timestamp it or how is that first like done when let's say the first bee returns? So the dance that he's giving, is that the angle that it was captured or has he already calculated what it It's seen? calculated. Okay, since yeah. he returned? Yeah. Okay. Not only that, in some, um, cloudy days like today, how do you see the sun? So they have a special uh, way, um, UV ability to um, see uh, where the sun is exactly um, regardless to um, the weather conditions. But isn't that why also like flies and moths get confused? Uh, and they fly around lights because they think it's the sun and they use the sun to calculate yep. where they're going. Exactly. And so they're like, okay, it's constantly moving, so they're mm -hmm. constantly compensating <laughs> until they just get stuck to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think these are smarter. Than yeah, I guess so, because I've never seen a bee stuck to a light. You don't see that much, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so just something else I really wanted to show you is this uh, plaster cast of, um, of an, uh, an ant nest, uh, which is really incredible. So apart from their ability to communicate with each other, just the structure itself of the nest, um, and, and, and the way that, again, they forge these channels through and um, I heard, I don't remember where it was that I heard or read that um, the structure is always similar um, regardless to the size of, uh, of, the, of, the, co of the colony itself. 
So they'll always have uh, these kind of structures, and the chambers will always be the same size. It's something interesting to think about. So, so, so far we looked at um, tree branching communication and quorum sensing. And I also wanted to um, to suggest or to look at other network system, which is uh, a looping network system that exists usually in our the retina of our eyes or in um, the wings of butterflies and insects and in uh, tree leaves, but in leaves itself. And the nice thing about looking at uh, looping network systems, especially when we come to design um, systems like such as um, uh, water piping or electricity, we really want to think about um, systems that are rigid and permanent, that are not um, as spontaneous or um, temporary as uh, systems we saw before. And this is an experiment that was done. Um, let me see. Okay. I'll show you the images. Of, but I think you can find it online. So it's uh, I mean, if you find if you look online on uh, lemon tree and blockage, you might find this. Or looking network systems, you might find this. Anyway, what they did was. They create a blockage in the network system, and then they um, added a fluorescent dye to say to see how um, the nutrients would flow in the leaf. And and these are the results. So so the system itself is designed in such a way that if there is a blockage, uh, for example, an insect bites the leaf, or if it dries in some areas, that the nutrients would still be able to reach all the um, all the parts of the leaf, regardless to um, the, uh, the blockage in, in the system itself. So something else interesting to look at. Do you guys want me to stop here, or should we continue and do the workshop? I mean, uh, I can stop here and then go, because I was going to start talking about slime a little bit. It's really up to you. You, should we have I think a break? We should know more about slime mold before we. No, no, we we're going to come back and talk about the slime mold, but I rather like talk with so wild, wild workshopping. No, not wild, but if you take, take a break, break. then yeah, take a break. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll have another like 15 minutes of talk, and then we'll start the workshop. Yeah. Have a lot to be said about the workshop. Okay.